But the horses, who are largely understood to sort of be able to walk between the worlds, in other words, be completely grounded and here on earth, and also completely connected with the spiritual realms, um, they actually told us that they are here to help us step into our power and as memory keepers for us. So when you said there's something special mm-hmm. about horses, um, I think you're right. They they're they're ready to help us reconnect with mm-hmm. who we are and what we came here to do. So that's why people kind of can't um, can't get past horses. Welcome to the Wake Up With Gratitude podcast, where we share new and different ways to practice gratitude that you might not have thought of before. Our guests come from many different and diverse backgrounds, and the one thing they all have in common is a passion for gratitude. I'm Julie Boye, a gratitude and gut health expert, and I love showing you different ways to practice gratitude that you might not have thought of before. Hello, friends. Welcome back to the podcast. It's Julie Boya here, and I'm so grateful you've joined us for this episode. I've got a wonderful guest today, Pamela Allen LeBlanc of Reiki from the Farm. And we're going to talk about some wonderful ways that Reiki and gratitude are connected, and also how we're connected to animals, how we can work with animals and communicate with animals. So I'm very excited to have Pamela on the podcast with us today. Before we start this interview, I wanted to share a very special milestone with you. This week marks the three-year anniversary of the Wake Up With Gratitude podcast. I made a decision to start this podcast in December of 2019. I didn't want to wait till the new year. I wanted to get things going in December. It just made it easier for me to have a goal that started in December as opposed to waiting till January 1st. And I'm so grateful that it did because this gave me momentum going into the new year to launch this podcast. I've really enjoyed being connected with you over these past few years. And I want to say thank you to everyone who stuck with me during my hiatus where I didn't use my podcast for almost three months. So thank you so much for being here. And if it's your first time here, I hope you'll stick around for the next year and beyond because who knows where this podcast is going to go. One more thing I wanted to celebrate with you is that the podcast hit a pretty big milestone. There aren't a lot of ways to really establish how a podcast is doing. We don't often get a lot of feedback. I know it's not always easy to take the time to leave a review or a rating for the podcast. So most of the data from a podcast comes from downloads. And download doesn't always mean that someone listens to and someone might be listening to it and also not to do a download. So it's not really that metric is perfect for downloads, but it's what we have to go by. So I'm celebrating 150 downloads in three years. It's about 50,000 downloads a year. That's exciting. It just shows that this podcast is being listened to, that people are taking the time to listen to it on the go and download it. And I have exciting things coming up for the next year going into 2023. And I want us to be there together. You know, gratitude is something that doesn't go out of style. It is something that we continue to use and to practice on a daily basis. And I want this podcast to be a place where we can share our stories of gratitude and inspire you, the listener, to find new and different ways to practice gratitude or even be reminded of the ways that you practiced gratitude before and start that up again. So friends, I'm so excited to welcome our guest today, Pamela Allen LeBlanc, sharing this wonderful podcast interview with you. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Wake Up With Gratitude podcast. I'm your host, Julie Boyer, and today I'm welcoming Pam Allen LeBlanc to the podcast. Hello, my friend. Hello. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited you're here. Uh, Pam is another fellow Canadian from the other coast. She lives in New Brunswick, so there's a four-hour time difference for us, so it's awesome that we can connect in this way. 
Her business is called Reiki from the Farm. It is a podcast and a business. She is very passionate about animals and animal communication. She has a degree in animal communication. I'm so interested to learn more about this. Um, and also to get into Reiki and, you know, the connections with Reiki and gratitude and all these beautiful things. So we have, you know, we may live on opposite coasts, but we have lots of things in common. And I'm just excited to get into this conversation, Pam. So as I like to start the podcast, tell me a little bit about your story because you're doing something that's definitely non-traditional. So I'd love to hear more about, you know, how you kind of got to be this person with a degree in animal communication. Well, and actually, um, I... I'm a scientist first. So I'm an animal scientist and I um, have a, and I actually have a, my master's degree is in business. So I'm very, very logical and left brain. And um, I don't know that I really would have believed in Reiki, but I ran into some health challenges that the medical system couldn't help me with. I was diagnosed with fibromyalgia and I had some allergies that um, skin allergies and and just a lot of discomfort that the medical system couldn't couldn't mm-hmm. assist me with. And one of my horseback riding students, I also taught horseback riding lessons in my spare time. And one of my horseback riding students offered me Reiki. And I wasn't really a big believer that it would help, but I was kind of at the point where I would try anything. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, um, and, you know, it really helped. And I thought there's something to this. So of course the scientist in me needed to dig into it. And I did. And then as I dug into it, um, I eventually wound up doing my practitioner course, which is a two-day course, and it just was able to heal the the issues that I was struggling with health-wise. And then following that, that's when the animal communication came in. And I think that the that the Reiki really facilitated that and helped that to happen. I can see that how the Reiki, you know, oh, because it opens up channels in yourself and then it allows you to connect you were already a horse person yes, right um how is this did you grow up around horses i did i yeah. did my father and my grandfather had uh horses we didn't get horses till i was 14 but i was just a horse crazy kid from the time at my grandparents and then i got my own horse at 14 and i guess and now i have 12 horses in my own farm and just um have learned so much from them and um and from reiki and by putting those two things together yes you're right that opened the intuition and that allowed the animal communication to begin to flow yeah especially with horses you know i'm new to the horse world i am being dragged into the horse world by my daughter, who is a horse crazy kid, just, you know, if it was her choice, we would already have a horse. If it was her choice, she would spend her days, you know, with the horses on the farm. And there is something about horses in general. I mean, I really love animals, but there's something different about horses in the way that, you know, talk to me about that because there is something different about horses and communication. And I'm just curious to hear a little bit more about that, especially from someone who brought Reiki into this world of animal communication. Well, what happened was that I wasn't really open to animal communication either, but Reiki had helped me so much that I had one horse that I just couldn't get through to. And a friend, uh, introduced me to an animal communicator. As a scientist, though, we can get behind the understanding that there is body language that backs up what an animal is expressing. So that's, you know, and that's readable, that's measure, somewhat measurable. And so I kind of immersed myself in that, but there, I still couldn't get through to this one particular horse. And that's the first time that it happened to me. And, um, really wanted to help her. And uh, so I watched the animal communicator with her eyes closed. She would communicate with the horse and I would watch the horse's body language. And it was really backing up what she would then turn around 
and tell me. And she wasn't watching the body language at all. So I thought, this is real. And I thought, well, you know, I'm a little bit intuitive. Maybe I can learn to do that. I couldn't. I, I did the courses. I read the, the books on how to do it. But I think they're largely written by people who are natural animal communicators and I was not natural at it. It it really wasn't easy for me. Um, but I did a course in uh, Reiki it had led me to this wonderful horse course by Christy Clark. And I don't think she teaches them anymore, but um and it was around Linda Kahanov's Tao of Equus work. And during that course, the first exercise was to communicate with animals. And I was completely embarrassed because I'd been trying and I couldn't and I stayed behind and talked to um, Christy's mom, who was facilitate was helping her facilitate. And she said, "You know, nobody can hear their own animals, Pam. They're too emotionally involved in them. But go ahead and use the techniques we outlined and go see if you can connect with ours." And it was just like somebody flipped a switch. It all started coming in. Over time, I felt those courses were so valuable and Christy it wasn't able to complete continue teaching them. So I taught my own version of them. And what would happen is that everybody in the class would go through the, the steps and and they would be able to understand what the animals were communicating afterward. And it's a it wasn't through body language, it's more of a telepathic type of communication. But then Julie, um I I got a message from a lady or she contacted me and said, look, we want we hear people can hear the animals after your deeply spiritual horse weekend. We don't want to spend the whole weekend. We don't even like horses. We like cats. Can you create a course <laughs> that that we can? <laughs> oh my gosh. For the cats. For the cats and for the people who wanted yeah. to understand them. And I actually said no <laughs> at first. And then I, as many of us, we we get very connected with source and whatever name sure, that yeah. you call it. And I kind of got a tap on the shoulder from source that said, you, you probably could teach them that and kind of showed me how I could teach them in a in a shorter period of time. And so I've been teaching animal communication to people since um, 2010, I guess, wow. since that first request came in. And it's evolved so much that I, just last weekend, I taught a class and um, a bunch of new information kind of came through and presented itself. So I'm looking to um, evolve that class and I'll be writing a book about it and yes. some more books that's all in process yeah. now because it's it it's such a sort of an effortless way to get there so yeah it, you know what's interesting is Pam is that I come from a very science background too and I'm very you know I love research I love good research. I love reading the research. I can understand how to read research. Yeah. I did, uh, you know, my, I did all the science in high school. Then I did my first year in science in university. I have a, then I switched to a kinesiology degree. So human science, still science. I, right. Still science, just human based. And I'm, I've always been like, I was fascinated by genetics growing up and epidemiology and like all these like really big things. And at the same time, it turns out that I'm an empath and a highly intuitive or highly sensitive person and highly intuitive. And I think, you know, I hear a little bit of your story and I, I, I can understand that, like that part of you that's like, I don't, there, the science, there's no real like science here, but I can see that it's working. And so your mind is like, okay, I'm looking for, right. But I know that it's working. And I love that you have been able to let, to get to that point where you are trusting your intuition and then being of service to others in that way because you finally trusted your intuition, you know, kind of gave in, like you said, the tap on the shoulder and then shared what you'd learned with others. And, you know, it's interesting. I, I have, I've had cats almost my whole life and I recent, more recently became like a dog person. We have two dogs now. And, the, you know, something that, 
caught my attention as a science-based person with animal communication was, which is why I was like open to having this conversation too, is like, do you know about the the buttons for dogs? Like where they, ta- they press the buttons to say different words and oh. communicate language with us. So I was like, if dogs can communicate using buttons with familiar words, like why can't this incredible work that you do, like why not be open to this as well? Because there's, there must be so much more going on and sort of from your perspective, like what is it about, you know, is it just that animals are way smarter than we think they are? Like, tell me a little bit more about that. Well, absolutely. And you know something, I will circle back because I realized too, Julie, I didn't answer your question about horses and that fits right into this as well. Um, there is There are a lot of cultures who believe that horses walk between the worlds. And so you did mention you felt there was something special about horses. And I'm also one of the co-authors of the ICRT Animal Reiki course. And one of the things that happened during that course is that the different species of animals kind of told us what they were here to teach us, like the cats told us they were here to slow us down because we're too busy. And <laughs> they, they they get on us, their purr uh, sort of settles our heart rate. And, and then we don't want to get up because we don't want to disturb the cat. And so it slows us down. The dogs told us that they were here to show us um, just a, to, as a symbol of the unconditional love that our creator has for us and and to remind us that we're beautiful. And until we can recognize how beautiful and magnificent we are, they're going to hold on to that task for the both of our species until we do. But the horses, who are largely understood to sort of be able to walk between the worlds, in other words, be completely grounded and here on earth, and also completely completely connected with the spiritual realms, um, they actually told us that they are here to help us step into our power and as memory keepers for us. So when you said there's something special mm-hmm. about horses, um, I think you're right. They, they're they they're ready to help us reconnect with mm-hmm. who we are and what we came here to do. So that's why people kind of can't um can't get past horses but yes to answer your question they are much more intelligent than what we believe them to be or what maybe what i previously believed or, them yeah, previously. to be um and so one of the things that shows showed up um around that is there's a wonderful film that dr jean goodall um narrates um, and I'll see if I can send you a link to that yes, film. Please. I can't think of the title right yeah. now. Yeah. But you can include that for the listeners in the podcast. And it's all it's all around animal communication and some of the science. So I thank mm-hmm. you for applauding me for using my intuition, but I have to be really fair and say I did look up to see if there was science behind. Yeah. Reiki behind animals. Yeah, yeah. I really was still it's, a skeptic. <laughs> so, but that's, but that's what I like about you, right? It's like, <laughs> you know, when we come from a background of science, it's sometimes hard to like, we're just always going to look for, and sometimes there are definitely things that science can't explain and that's okay too. It's, it's this, okay. So one concept that I talk about with gratitude is I talk about the idea that we can hold two things at once. Yes. We can hold gratitude and grief at the same time. One, they're not exclusive. They can be held at the same time. So I also believe we can be science-based and science-focused and also at the same time, allow intuition to play a role in what we're doing. And you don't have to be one or the other. Both can exist. And I think what's happened is that, you know, in so many ways, the two, it's like you're either one or the other, but that's not... We're, we live in a world of and, I believe, as opposed to or. And so much of my work is is teaching people the gratitude and. So you can be going through a difficult time in your relationship 
and still find gratitude. You can be going through, you know, a traumatic time or an incident or a loss and still find gratitude. You can have a chronic illness, right? You mentioned briefly, right? And still find gratitude. And I think that's where that connection of you can be a science-based person yeah. and you can also allow your intuition to do this work and guide you in these ways. So that, I think that message is really important from what you're sharing. Oh, thank you. It, I think it is. And I, you know, as I realized that this was real, I, I just, my nature, I had to dig in, well, how, why, how does it work? And mm-hmm. I remember the name of that movie, uh, Julie, but I can still send you a link to Please it. Please do, yeah. Yeah, it's called When Animals Talk. Mm-hmm. And what they did was they took um, a scientist and they they went through and just um, examined a lot of the phenomena that were happening where animals could talk. And um, they, they looked at five or six different case scenarios and situations and a couple of my favorite stories and you reminded me of it when you said language is there was an African gray parrot who had uh, quite a large vocabulary and what they did was they because this is a telepathic style of, of communication and I believe it's something that we used to be able to do but we've forgotten so my whole course is about removing the barriers and blocks so that you can remember this pathway that we always had or have had. And um, But in this particular instance, they put the African gray on one floor of the house and they put the his caregiver on the bottom floor, like on a different story and as far apart as they could. And then they filmed them and time-stamped the interviews. And what she did was she opened up photographs out of envelopes that she had previously not seen. And it was so interesting because over 50% of the time, the parrot would describe the photo that she was looking at, like with, with his words. And what she found fascinating is that he would even like, when she was looking at the timestamps, uh, and they they put them both on the same screen afterwards so that she could see. And he would start talking about things as she noticed them. Like at first, uh, there's one in particular, which was a taxi and there was a man leaning out. So the, the bird, you know, goes car, yellow car. And then as she noticed the man leaning the head out, the bird began to to describe that. And she felt, I actually felt that the accuracy probably would have been a little higher. Um, But what she found was when she really tried to send the messages, it didn't work. (laughs) When she just, yeah, when she just relaxed and looked at the photos, it did. So that was fascinating. And if you'd like another example, there were uh, these dogs that could detect cancer from their olfactory senses. They and they clicker trained them, and they had petri dishes. And they, you know, when they would sit and mark the petri dish that had the cancerous cells, they would click that that's what they wanted. So they trained these dogs, and they tested them, and. I think they had like a hundred percent accuracy or something ridiculous, except there was one sample that was supposed to not be cancerous and the dogs kept sitting by it. Like they would sit by the one that was supposed to be, and then they would get up and go sit by that one. And every dog did it. So they put that sample away in the cupboard. They couldn't figure out what was going on with the experiment. And um, they would go sit by the cupboard. <laughs> And so the the scientists actually um, returned that sample to the lab and they said, can you ask this individual to come in again um, and just test him again and be very thorough? And it's not that they hadn't been thorough. It's just the diagnostic equipment had not picked up cancer and the dogs did. And um, they tested it again. They 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 got brought the individual back, did another series of tests, and he did have cancer. The cancer was back. So the dogs have the 
ability to be that much more accurate and just communicating with all animals since, you know, for the last, I guess, more than 10 years, I've learned so much just by becoming open to communicate with the species. They they really do have that higher level of sensitivity than we do. And, you know, they know when we're going to be home, even if there's no way of them knowing. And they did an experiment with that, with two dogs that always knew when their person would be coming home. And it's not like they heard the the vehicle or anything because he was coming on a subway and, um, you know, elevators that go constantly and in an apartment in a very busy city. So it's not like they could even smell him and they still did. So it was really neat. Oh, I, th- I think you're muted. <laughs> I was muted because, um, yeah, it was got loud here for a second because of the dogs. Speaking of dogs, they know we're talking about them. I swear they know what we're talking about. <laughs> but I love how you said too that like, yeah, it's, there's a lot that we still, and there's a lot that we still don't understand, of course. And, um, you know, to connect back to the work that you do with Reiki, yes. I think one of the things, you know, there's different tenants to Reiki and the way that that whole practice works. And you mentioned that one of the principles of Reiki is of course, gratitude. And you said it's, I will be filled with gratitude. So I have a small amount of experience with Reiki, not a lot. Um, I had, I took a course many years ago. It really helped me actually when my daughter was born, she ended up uh, in the hospital a couple of days after she was born with a really serious jaundice, like, you know, within hours of needing a blood transfusion because she was so sick. Wow. And I used Reiki on her. I just kept doing Reiki on her to just, I said, give me the, I told the doctor, I said, give me till the morning. Let me do this to, <laughs> let me do, sorry, the dogs, of course, let me do this. So to help my daughter and, you know, by the next morning she was getting enough, like healing enough so that she didn't need the blood transfusion. So mm-hmm. I have such a beautiful experience, but it's very limited. So when you were talking about Reiki and gratitude together, which is what brought you on to the podcast, just in general, tell me a little bit more about how that connects to the work that you're doing. Well, you know, I believe that there's always a balance in the world. In other words, there's always positive and there's always negative. And you can choose to look at or see the positive or the negative. And I find that Reiki um, really helps connect you with the positive. And then whatever your thoughts are, um, that creates your reality. So if you're really thinking and connecting with positive, you bring more positive into your life. Part of the um, Reiki principles that came through with the Reiki energy um, from Yusui Sensei, its founder in the 1920s, were these five Reiki ideals just for today. I will not worry. I will not anger. I will be devoted to my work. I will be kind And I will be filled with gratitude. And he reminds us every day to repeat that as we, um, in gasho position, like with our hands together and Reiki energy flowing, just to remember that just for today, that's what we'll do. And one of the, the, I, I love all of it, of course, but gratitude has really become a, a huge aspect of my life. I notice that every morning I write in my journal and I write, you know, what I'm grateful for Mm -hmm. and what that seems to do that blends together with the Reiki energy. And it brings me more things to be grateful for. It just really heightens and amplifies that focus on the positive that then brings more positive. And Reiki is incredible for helping to manifest. And I go for a Reiki walk after where the dogs and I um, just try to spread Reiki light and love and energy wherever we walk. And you can't help but be in gratitude when Reiki energy is flowing through you. It's just one of the aspects of this energy. And so you're just, you're looking around at nature, just grateful for the tree and for the water and for the 
the mushrooms and the soil and just everything that you see. So gratitude is a very, very big part of, of Reiki and, and part of our practice, I guess. Yeah. And it shows up in your own life, like you said, in your morning practice. So is it like a morning pages pack practice or is it really just a journaling practice that you do in the morning? Probably. It actually, I began doing it um, when I was reading Julia Cameron's oh, yeah. work. And so, yeah. yeah, it is a morning pages that I do. And inevitably, you know, I, I just start writing three or four mm-hmm. pages to help me sort out my day and my life and <laughs> and um it usually i wind up solving some maybe problems or things that i'm trying to figure out mm. and then it always ends up in gratitude for me just you know and and for me i use the word god and you know thank you god for this and mm. for that and for the other things in my life and then i just notice that and then i go out into my day just with my heart um, filled with gratitude. And I just noticed that just so much beauty. Um, Reiki has just impacted that so much that it's brought so much beauty into my life um, that sometimes it's overwhelming. It's a little overwhelming to um, to contain, to be a container for that much beauty and that much, that many things to be grateful for. And, um, but I recently heard from someone who said you know what you that 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 reminded me that I don't have to be a container for it because it just spills over (laughs) and it spills into other people and uh, especially with the work I do teaching and and um and with my own podcast and so on Julie so yeah Beautiful. beautiful just uh, and just for those listeners that don't know what we're talking about. So there's a beautiful book by Julia Cameron called The Artist's Way. And I had heard of these morning pages before, and I'd heard of this book before, but part of my sabbatical, this, you know, the break that I took this summer after my burnout was I, this book came into my world, right? At a garage sale for $5, the original book. And I said, wow, this is the sign that I need to start doing this. and you know, the day after I read the first introduction and talked about writing these morning pages, I have not missed a single day since I write. And I was already writing. I have a journal practice at night. So to start a new morning, you know, practice was really different for me because I have, I've had so many different morning gratitude practices in the past, but mine, like you, it's not, I mean, it's not always about gratitude, but it often shows up in my writing. Yes. And I find these morning pages, it's it's very intimate. Yes. Um, I find that uh, there's a lot of things I'll say in my morning pages that I would never say otherwise, but I'm glad that I got them out on the page. So it is a beautiful practice and it can be part of a journaling gratitude practice or not. But that's if someone wants to learn more about it, Julia Cameron, The Artist's Way is the book. And it can be both a spiritual practice and a gratitude practice and just a venting practice too. (laughs) It's on the days, Julie, like I'm like you, I have missed a few days, but they are few and far between. And when I have to miss a day, because maybe I'm teaching at five in the morning for for, for Chinese students, that um, it. I, you know, or just if my schedule just occasionally my schedule just doesn't allow and it doesn't feel right. Yeah. <laughs> day doesn't go yeah. as well. I really don't like um, to miss my, my writing three pages every day. It's so interesting, you know, and you've shared so many great practices and introduced us to so many different things. So if our listeners wanted to connect with you or learn more about what you do, where's the best place to find you? Oh, thank you, Julie. They could certainly email me, Pam, at ReikiFromTheFarm.com. Um, and they could also check out my website, which is www.ReikiFromTheFarm.com. And um, yeah, I'd love to love to hear from anyone who is interested in any of this. Oh my goodness. Yes. So many new, wonderful things that you've shared on the podcast. So many ideas and open doors, I think that you've left us. So I hope our listeners will find you. You have a podcast as well, so they can listen to that. 
As always, the relevant links will be in our show notes. And I just encourage you to connect with Pam if something in what we shared today really resonated with you. You know, this was different content than we've shared before. I love having new and different ideas that we've not talked about before and bringing that back all to gratitude. And that's what I love about gratitude is that there's always a place for gratitude in whatever it is that we're doing. And that connects us all in such a beautiful way. So as we wrap things up, Pam, were there any sort of last words around Reiki or animal communication or even gratitude that you wanted to leave us with? Well, you know, if you don't mind, um, there's a really neat practice that my family and I do. do. I that. that is... Um, Whenever we're together sharing a meal together, we have a gratitude rock. And maybe your listeners already know about that, but we pass the rock from person to person. And that person says what they're grateful for that day. And I know when my kids were teenagers, they'd roll their eyes and say, oh, <laughs> you know, I don't even know if I have anything. And we'd say, no, you've got to get one thing. And you know, we would usually do it at the end of the meal to wrap up our meal, but it would just, it would shift their attention maybe if they'd had a bad day. Um, so it was just lovely. And then that rock stays on the table and the kids look for it now. They're in their 20s now and they're like, okay, who's got the gratitude rock? <laughs> oh, oh I, love I love it too. So I wanted to make sure to Thank share you. that. You're yeah. welcome. Okay, so this is why I love doing podcasts and I will never stop. No one's ever shared that before. <laughs> We've shared different ways to share gratitude around the table, but not with this idea of the gratitude rock. So this is what's so incredible is that I, you know, we never, it is a practice because it is always changing and evolving and new ideas will inspire somebody who might have listened to all of the podcast episodes, but what you share today is the one that connects with them in particular. So thank you so much for being a guest today on the podcast. I really enjoyed our time together and I hope our listeners did too. And hope they will connect with you to learn more about Reiki from the farm, animal communication, and all the wonderful things you're doing. Thanks so much, Pam. Thank you so much, Julie, for having me. Blessings. Thanks for sticking around till the end of the podcast. I appreciate you. If you're not already following us on your favorite app, make sure you click on the check or follow podcast so you'll be alerted every time there's a new podcast episode. If you enjoyed the episode and want to help us grow, here's some easy things that you can do. You can leave a review on your favorite app. You can share this podcast with a friend and send it directly. And you can also share through social media. Feel free to tag me on any posts in your stories and I'll repost. Thank you to Paul Tedeschini for doing the post-production audio for the podcast. And one last thing, I hope you're choosing to wake up with gratitude every single day.